morning, Rocky Peak. Great to see you. If we haven't met yet, my name's Michael. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, just uh, just want to welcome you as well. Uh, I don't know how many of you were here for Encounter uh, Wednesday night, but... Um, it was uh, truly amazing. Um, for those of you who weren't here, uh, it was like uh, kind of a, uh, like the, the roads were backed up. All these San Susan, like people couldn't get in. And the reason is uh, every single parking space was full. We had to start parking people on the grass. Uh, we didn't have enough room here in the worship center, so we had to, uh, we had to open up the ridge as an overall of people in the patio. And the, the reason I mentioned that, and by the way, we, we ended at nine like planned, but there was just so much hunger to go on, we just dismissed anyone who wanted to go on. We had our first ever afterglow here at Rocky Peak, uh, and we, uh, we, we went another 35 minutes just in worship. It was just a truly amazing night. But the reason I mention is a couple things, not, not just to celebrate it, but also if you were one of the ones that were stuck in traffic or couldn't find per, uh, parking or you turned around and went home because you couldn't get in or something, uh, I just want to know let you know that uh, we're really aware of that. We're going to figure out what to do yet. We decided we either have to build a bigger building um, or we have to have some of you lose some weight so the mosh pit can have more room. I'm not sure which, but uh, anyway, uh, we're, we're, I just want to make you more aware, aware of that. I mean, no one's complained or whatever, but I'm sure that if that was, if you, if you couldn't get in, it was probably frustrating. We understand that. And uh, so we're, we're kind of looking like, what does that look like? Do we do like back-to-back encounters on a Wednesday and Thursday? There's two options or like, what does that look like? But uh, anyway, I uh, just want to let you know that we're, we, we appreciate uh, all your love and care and support for that. Secondly, I uh, just want to remind you, and we've been announcing this, but uh, tonight is our next movement course. And so I'll be teaching that at six o'clock here. It's on two Sunday nights, just Sunday night and then two, two weeks from now. And this is where we share a, kind of our vision and our values as a strategy. Jesus, the church is a place that kind of we, um, it's, it's, a, it's the course you take if you want to become a, uh, we call it a partner, other churches call it a member, um, but it's just a great uh, time together. We do bring in a light dinner each night, and so there is room. We've got, I, uh, as of last night, there's over 80 people signed up, but I know we still have room, and if you would like to come, just come and sign up online, then we'll know how many, uh, tonight's Urbane Cafe dinner, so we're going to need to bring in the right amount of food uh, for that. So um, other than that, I think we're ready to go. Are you guys ready to jump in? Okay, so I, I've, got to, um, I've got to warn you. Remember last week I said that uh, that was kind of part A of the message, and this is going to be part B. And you remember uh, last week how I, chal- I told you it was going to be challenging. You remember that? Um, well, this week it's going to be more challenging, all right? And the reason I mentioned that, oh, we got some kind of alarm going off here. Okay, uh, the reason I mentioned that is because, you know, spiritual warfare is a very real thing. And uh, in this service, I, I believe that for many of you, that this is going to be a life-changing service for reasons that become apparent later. And because of that, uh, the enemy doesn't want you to be paying attention today. Uh, he wants to distract you. And when the time comes for making your decisions later on, he's going to try to keep do everything he can to keep you from listening to the Holy Spirit. So I, I just want to charge you uh, as, as a church, is it... But today we want to be especially listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We want to be aware of any distractions during this time because I truly believe that for many of us today it's going to be a high holy day. Amen? Amen. Let's go before the Lord. So, Father, we come before you. We just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his life and death and resurrection, which changes everything. That gives us entrance into this new life that changes us from enemies into sons and daughters that releases the power of the Spirit in our life to lead, guide, and empower us and and puts us under your authority as part of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we come today in kingdom authority under your leadership, and we just pray that that you would be ruling in this place. I think of what you said to the seven churches of Revelation, let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I pray today, Lord, you would guard us from any distractions. I pray you put your angels around this place and that um, you would make this a safe zone for the fo- safe zone for the voice of your spirit, and that as always we would listen, and that we would follow. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, "Amen." Amen. Well, our story starts today late at night. He's been working on this book for some time now, and from the very beginning, as he's kind of laid it out and structured the work, he's not sure exactly how he's going to handle this particular section. And the reason is there was so much that happened that night 
There was so much that was said, so much that was done that he, he wants to be able to capture that story. But the challenge is, is just limited space in this book of what to include. And as his mind goes back to that night that though it's 50 years ago, it's still as fresh in his mind as if it happened yesterday. And part of the reason is he's told the story of that night so many times over the last 50 years. But the biggest challenge he faces is he now comes to the section, what do you include? What do you leave out? How do you capture not only the spirit, but but the teaching that was given that night that was destined to change all of their lives forever? Well, today we are continuing this series uh, that we're in called Hearing God, Discerning His Voice. And for those of you who are brand new, uh, we're actually taking a break. We're in a longer study of the, uh, the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Romans, but we're taking a break um, at the start of the year to focus in on this important topic. And the, the core concept of this series is very simple. It's that if we want to walk well with God, if we want to um, experience kind of develop a truly personal relationship with him. If we want to um, experience his presence, his power, and his leading in our life, and if we want to carry out his vision and calling in our life, then one of the most critical skills and most important experiences that we need to develop, we need to experience, is how to, how to hear and recognize, to listen and respond to the voice of God in our life in the many different ways he speaks. And so if you were here last week, um, I kind of gave you part A of this message. And what we saw is that if we want to hear from God on a regular basis, we want to have a close relationship, we sense what the Spirit's saying, that, that we have to become a certain kind of person, the kind of person that Jesus described that God's top priority is that we would love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all our mind, the way I put it is that, that to know him and to love him and to please him becomes our top priority and our deepest passion in life. And so today we wanna build on that and, and ask the question, so, so how do I know if I'm that kind of person? Um, what does it look like to pursue God for that kind of relationship? And what we're gonna see today is that if we want to build that kind of relationship, if we want to hear God speak, there's one non-negotiable. And if we had to boil it down in a single word, it's the word obedience. That we have to be a people that's eager not just to listen, but also to follow. And so today we want to take some time to talk about this concept of obedience, why obedience is so important, how, what role does it play in our relationship with God, and, and why is it so central, so key to hearing his voice in our life. And so there, there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called Hearing God, the Non-Negotiable. What I want to do is give you three big picture principles that help us understand obedience, why it's so important, the role it plays, how it works, and then come back at the end and ask two very penetrating uh, questions. And so uh, let's jump in. So the first principle goes like this, here, uh, that the story of our race, you know, the, kind of if you were to stand back and tell the big picture story of our race, there's, there's many ways we could tell that story, but one of the ways we could tell it is the story of our race, it's a story of disobedience versus obedience, okay? So if you want to say, hey, what's the story the Bible's telling? What's the story of our race? Many different ways we could describe that, but I think one of the, one of the best ways to describe it is it's a story of obedience versus disobedience, or disobedience versus obedience. And so, uh, let me share what I mean. So if we, we start off, we go to the very first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter one, we're introduced to this amazing creator. And we're created, remember, to be like him. Like we're created in his image. And catch this, because we are like him, we have the capacity to be in relationship with him. And because we are like him, we can rule over the creation for him. So we're, we're created for this very close and intimate relationship with, with God, we hear his voice, we sense his presence, right? But, but very early in the story, we get to Genesis 3, we rebel against our creator. 
we reject our leader, his leadership and we disobey because we think we can do better on our own, we think life would go better if we go out on our own, and we listen to the great enemy of our race, the Satan, um, and as a result, we're gonna experience death, uh, just like the creator warned. Because if you stop and think about it, if you cut yourself off from the source of all life, the end result is gonna be death, right? And so, so we're gonna experience death, but it's not just physical death, it's death at every level. And one of the most important levels is spiritual death. And you say, well, what is spiritual death like? Well, think of it like this. If we see someone, they're asleep, and they say they're dead to the world, like, what do we mean? It means they're completely unconscious of their surroundings and us, right? Well, when we became dead to, dead to God, well, what happens, we became completely unaware of his presence, we're, we're unaware of his voice, we're cut off from the reality. So he surrounds us all the time, but we're largely unaware of it, right? Now, the surprise twist in this story, if, and it, we're, just, oh, we're so familiar, it might not seem like a surprise, but if you were to read the story for the first time, the surprise twist is that this creator, instead of destroying us and then starting over with a new race, that he decides to pursue us to restore this love relationship and to restore the life that we lost. And so, uh, what, this is why Messiah comes. This is why Jesus comes. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter five, and we'll get there you know, sometime after Easter when we kind of get back into Romans, that the Apostle Paul in chapter five, he stands back, he says, let me tell you the big picture story of our race. This is one of the ways he tells it. He says, the story of our race is a tale of two men. The first man that led our race into disobedience that resulted in death, and the second man, and through his obedience, led to life. In fact, there in your note sheet, this is how Paul puts it in Romans 5. He says, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, so who's the one man? Adam. Yeah, Adam. And remember, in Hebrew, uh, Adam or Adam means man. Right? So through the disobedience of the one Adam, uh, the many were made sinners. The whole race fell into rebellion. But he said, so also through the what? The obedience of the one man, which man? Jesus, right? The many will be made righteous. So Paul says, this is the story of our race. We're created for this love relationship with God. The first man led us into disobedience. It led to death and destruction. The second man, Jesus, has come that through his obedience would lead us into life. And so, and so our story of our race is a tale of disobedience versus obedience. Now we're gonna build on that. Each of these principles is gonna build, right? So, so let's talk about, so then why did Jesus come? What, what was his goal in coming? Why did he come? So number two, that Jesus came, we got a lot of blanks today. Just pretend I'm like Joel or Dre or something like that, all right? Okay, so Jesus came, to restore our love for God and our passion for obedience. If you were to say, hey, why did Jesus come? In this big picture story that he came to restore our love for God and our passion for obedience. So, so remember, we talked about this last week. Remember when Jesus came, um, he was once asked this question, hey, of all the laws in the law of Moses, 613, uh, which of them is most important? What's, what's God's top priority? And remember, he went right away to Deuteronomy chapter six, a very famous passage we call the Shema. And he said, this is top priority. Remember that you would love God with, remember, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, right? And so the way, the way I put that is that our top priority and our deepest passion is to know him to love him and to please him, which is what obedience is about, right? So here's what I want you to catch, that when Jesus came, he did not come just to forgive our sins. Like, yes, we needed our sins forgiven because without that, we can't have a relationship with God. But the reason he came was to restore this original relationship, to restore this love for God and create in us the passion to please him, this passion for obedience that we were we were designed for. Now, what's interesting is you see this love of God. If anyone models, what does it look like to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, to for God to be your top priority, pleasing him, your deepest, it's Jesus, right? He models this. 
And one of the reasons I love the Gospel of John is because in John's Gospel, he records several statements of Jesus that are like a window into the heart of Jesus that show us his deepest passion. And we don't have time to go over all seven of them, but what I want to do is highlight three just to give you, kind of tell you what I, show you what I mean. So the first one is in John 4, it's on your note sheet. So the situation is that Jesus uh, has led his men, they, they've gone into Samaria, they've stopped at a, a Samaritan town called Sychar, it's about noon, he's tired, he's hungry, so he sends his disciples into town to get some, get some food, get some lunch, and, and this frees him up to have this amazing conversation with this woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. well. They get back with lunch, and they're like, hey, we've got lunch, he says, I'm not hungry anymore. And then he says something incredibly profound. He says, my food, and I want you to think what food does for us. Food is what energizes us, what sustains us. If you've ever gone on an extended fast, you know what the level of energy, like what happens when you're not eating. He says, my food, he says, that which energizes me, which sustains me, it's to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's what I live on. That's what, that's what energizes me. The second passage is from John chapter 5. Now, in this passage, he had just healed a man who had been lame for 38 years on the Sabbath. And so the religious leaders were upset about that. And Jesus says, very truly, and remember, in the Greek, it says, amen, amen, which uh, is Jesus' way of saying, hey, sit up and pay attention. I'm about to say something very important. So he says, amen, amen, I tell you that the son can do nothing by himself. So he says, you think I just healed this guy on the Sabbath? That was my idea. I, I don't do anything by that. And then he said, he can only do what he sees his father doing. Almost a picture of like, say, Jesus growing up with his stepfather, Joseph, learning to be a carpenter or a stonemason. He's kind of watching and doing what his father does. He says, I just watch my father, then I just do what he, he shows me to do. And then in John 8, he's in controversy again with religious leaders. And he says, the one who sent me is what? He, he's with me. We're, we're together. And says, he's not left me alone. And he said, the reason is, I always do what pleases him. So if you look at the life of Jesus, his, it's just very clear that his top priority and his deepest passion was to know, to love, and to please his father. But here's the thing. When we come to Jesus, this becomes his, his uh, agenda for our life that he wants to transform us to be people like him, that love him with all of our heart, mind, and soul. We're transformed, that, that knowing him, loving him, pleasing him becomes our top priority in life, all right? That leads to number three. And so what we learn next in is that because of this, an obedience becomes the non-negotiable. That if we want to hear from God, if we want to draw close to God, have this close relationship where he speaks to us. You know, it's interesting, in Psalm 32, David said, he, says, he, he quotes something the Lord says to him, and it says, the Lord says in Psalm 32, he says, do not be like a horse or a mule that has to be jerked around control by a bit, right? Like, like that's not the relationship God wants to us, where he just... Like, like we're a pinball, right? And we're going the wrong direction. He just slaps us up one side of the head. Like circumstances change. Like he wants this relationship where we're hearing his voice, where we're, we're dissenting. And so, but what, what we're gonna learn now is that, that, that in this, rela you know, how do we know if we truly want this personal relationship with God? How do we know if we truly uh, are pursuing him, that we would love him with all of our heart? And the answer comes back throughout the whole Bible, but especially from Jesus, the way to tell is obedience. Like, how do you know if you truly love someone because you want to please them, right? That's right. And so Jesus is going to say this many times in his ministry, but one of the most important times is the last night he's with his men before he's arrested. And this takes us back to the story that we started the day with. Remember, we started this, the day with a story about this man who's working on a book late at night. He's come to this very important section, and he's trying to figure out how do I capture kind of the events and the message of that night in a way that truly communicates it. And that's sort of my historical reconstruction of how the apostle John might have felt as he's writing his gospel. But he gets to this very important night, this last night that Jesus is with his men, starts with Passover. Remember, it starts with just washing the feet, and then there's Passover, and all this incredible teaching that Jesus does this last night. 
He's got, a, he's got limited time and space. He's got a scroll, right? It's got limited room. A scroll costs about $2,500, not cheap. And so, like, how do, you, how do you capture that night? So what we have in John 13 through 17 is the teaching of Jesus last night with his men, some of those profound teaching in all the scripture. And one of the things that Jesus says, because remember, his men are all bummed out. He's leaving them. They don't know how this story is going to end. And he says, hey, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you as orphans. He said, I am sending another to take my place. And he says, the word he uses for the other one is this Greek word parakletos, which literally means, um, it means called alongside. And so he says, I'm sending another parakletos. And so uh, when, when people are trying to translate the Bible, they, they really struggle with what word to use for this. Like w- this name of this person that's gonna take Jesus' place and come alongside of them. And so for example, if you were to look at different translations, here would be some of the, the ways to be translated. Comforter, helper, uh, advocate, friend, counselor, right? You can see they're having a hard time, like how do you really describe? But here's the key word. The key word to me is not parakletos. The key word is the word another. Because that's the whole point. I'm leaving, but I'm sending another to take my place, to do for you what I did here. And in fact, in John 16, he will go on to say, that it's to your benefit that I leave because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit, the parakletos cannot come. Right? And he's gonna lead you into all truth. And so, so the question is, it comes, so, so that night Jesus is gonna teach about this parakletos who's coming. And uh, one of the things he's gonna say is, is that, hey, the, I'm sending, the Father's gonna send the parakletos, but he's not sending him to everyone. He's only sending him to people who truly love me. So let's look what he says. And the question is, well, how do you know that you love him? He's going to say, because you obey what I tell you. And so he's going to say it several times. So I'm going to look at a couple times in, in like here in John 14. This is the first time he talks about the parakletos. And he says, if you love me, you will what? You'll obey. So catch this. This is the way we know if we love him. Now, this is interesting. Jesus is going to say this many more times this night, but also we'll see it in the rest of the New Testament. Like the Apostle John who wrote this, he will later write a letter called 1 John. And you'll study it this week in your life group study. And in there he he says this, the one who says that I love him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Um, Jesus will say a similar thing in John 15, that same night, he'll say, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Here, the way he puts it is, if you love me, then you'll obey what I command. And he says, and and then here's what's going to happen. He says, then I will ask the Father and he will give you another parakletos, here it says, counselor, to be with you forever. So notice the relationship. Like not everyone's gonna receive the parakletos, it's those who love him and, and show that because they really wanna please him and they, they obey him. And so um, this is gonna raise questions in the disciples' minds. Remember, this is all new to them. They've never heard about this Holy Spirit coming to them, parakletos, they, it's all new. And so Judas, uh, not Judas Iscariot, you know, it's such a bummer of a name, right? Like, you're like one of the 12. What's your name? Judas. Like, not that guy. Not that guy, you know. <laughs> but, um, but so Judas is going to ask the question, wait a second. You're telling us you're not leaving us, that you're coming back to us, that, that you're not going to leave us as orphans. You're going to send this other parakletos. But like, why do some people get to see you and other people don't? And so Jesus lands. This is just a few verses later. He says, so Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And notice what Jesus says. If anyone loves me, he will what? Obey, Obey my teaching. And catch this, my father will love him and we will come to him and make our what? Home with him. He says, this is how it works. For those who love me, 
and you can tell who loves me by whether they, com- they obey my commands. He says, and then what's gonna happen is my father and I are gonna come by the, through the person of the Holy Spirit and we're gonna make our home. We're gonna move in. Now, I want you to remember that analogy, this moving in, this home. Okay, we're gonna come back to it later. But can you see how the story, the big picture story of the Bible is, is coming full circle? Created for this relationship, Lose the relationship, dead to God, but Jesus comes that through his life and death and resurrection, God can move in to our life again. And that we are no longer alone. And that that relationship is restored and we can know his voice. We know his presence and his voice. And so, and so what we see then is that in this whole big picture story, that obedience is the non-negotiable. So, now I've got a couple questions for you. Now, these are fairly penetrating. You may not be able to answer them right away, but I want you to think about them because they're extremely important. So, there in your note sheet, you have hearing God, two key questions. And here's the first question. So, the first question is, is are you absolutely surrendered? Okay. Like, would you say that you've come to a place, you're absolutely surrendered to Jesus, and so that you've surrendered all you are and all you have to him, and so your, your top priority and your deepest passion truly is to know him and to love him and to please him. Not that you always succeed, but that's truly the deepest passion of your life, and it's demonstrated by a life of obedience to what he's showing you through his word and through his spirit. Now, here's, I want you to catch this. this is such an important question because as we've seen, this is the key. So if we want to hear from God, we don't want to be like a horse or a mule that has to be jerked around, but we truly want to experience the presence and power. We want to sense the presence of God in our life and sense what he's speaking to us in the wide variety of ways that he does. So are we absolutely surrendered? Now, here's what I'd suggest. I think that for most of us, it takes a while to get there, doesn't it? that this, this is often a process. Like when someone first comes to Christ, and, or maybe you grew up in a Christian home, but there was a time when you just weren't taking it seriously, but then you kind of, you gave your life to Christ. When you first come to Christ, that, that, that right away we begin to experience what Jesus promised, right? We, we receive this forgiveness of sins. We sense the presence of the Holy Spirit coming in our lives, bringing the Father and the Son. There's this new relationship with God. It's like God moves into our house. And right away, the Holy Spirit begins rearranging the furniture, doesn't he? Like when the Holy Spirit comes right away, he begins making changes, say, let's, let's call it in the living room of our life, right? And, and so, and most of the time, these are beautiful changes that we really welcome. For example, uh, we find that we have this, this new uh, peace with God. We've got a new sense of peace with ourselves. There's a new meaning. There's new purpose in life that we, uh, there's a new joy, there's a new freedom. Many of the old habits or attitudes kind of fall away. Uh, it's just kind of like, like autumn leaves just kind of naturally go away. And so we, we sense this, this new change that has happened because God has moved into our life. And for the most part, in the early days, we're happy with these changes, what the Holy Spirit's doing. But you know, the Holy Spirit, when he purchased our house, which is what he did, like when we came to Jesus, he bought the title deed to our lives. You know, like Paul says, you've been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself, right? That when he, that the Holy Spirit is never content just to remodel, redecorate, clean out the living room of our life. That he is beginning, he's, at some point he's gonna begin to walk down the hallway to start cleaning the rooms. And these rooms represent different areas of our life. Here's a room maybe of finances, right? Here's the room of our sexuality. Here's the room of our relationships. Here's the room of our career. Here's the room of, you know, it just goes on and on, right? And so the Holy Spirit is gonna begin to, 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 to uh, come and begin to, to clean house. But the reality is that often what happens is that when we sense the Holy Spirit starting to come to certain rooms of our house, certain areas, what we do is we quickly make a sign that says private and we put it on the door. Or like no entrance, right? And if we sense the Holy Spirit trying the doorknob, we lock it from the inside. 
It's like we're not ready for him to come into that area of our life. We're not really ready to say all that I have, all that's, we're not really ready to surrender that. It's going, no, Jesus, you and the, the Father and the Son, you can live out in the living room, you can have the kitchen. We got this first, we got the master bedroom for you. That's good, right? But we're not ready to come into these rooms, these areas of our house. And you know why? The reason is these rooms are where we store our household idols. Just like Israel of old. And so we're not ready to surrender this area of my life or this area. You can have everything else, but not this area. But you know, the moment we do that, we begin putting distance between us and the Holy Spirit. And we begin to lose the joy, we begin to lose the presence. And the Holy Spirit's so patient, he's often like, okay, well, I'm gonna, I, I won't, but I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pull back. We'll live out here, but we're not gonna keep on moving through your life until you're ready. And so you say, well, what, what, what would you call those rooms or a house? What are some of the gods that we, that are in our house? And, and I've talked about this before, but for the purpose of this message, I would call these gods, these household gods, I would call them the seven Ps of idolatry. Okay. Now, if I were on my game, you would have all seven in your note sheet with a bullet by them, right? But I forgot to make that clear. So uh, I'm going to bring them up on the screen for you so you can jot them down. And as we do, what I want you to think through is your life. Like, what does absolute surrender mean? Absolute surrender says, these rooms are all open for you, Jesus. There's no room in my house that you can't talk to me about. You can talk to me about my finances. You can talk to me about my relationships. You can talk about my sexuality. You can talk about my career. You can talk about this bitterness. You can talk. There's no room that's off, off limits to you. That's what absolute surrender looks like. Right? And so these, these rooms that we lock are, are rooms that we say, hey, uh, you're fine out here, Jesus, in this area, but not in this room. So as we go through these seven uh, Ps of idolatry, what I want you to be thinking is, hey, does Jesus have his absolute way in this area of your life? Like, are you like, hey, whatever you say, Lord, speak, Lord, your servant's listening in these areas, all right? So, so the first P is the P of people. And this is a very broad category, but for many of us, one of the greatest gods in our life is certain types of relationship, and it can vary from person to person. It could be a dating relationship. It could be uh, 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 the marriage. It could be a dream of marriage. It could be, uh, it could be kids. It could be um, friendships. Um, but, but there's something that's like, for us, this is what life is all about. This is what like, makes life worth living. This is our, our top priority. This is our deepest passion. This particular relationship or this kind of relationship, right? It's a very common God. I think of our, our culture right now, one of the greatest gods of American culture is romance. That we just believe, if we could just find the right person and fall in love with the right person, life will be perfect, right? <laughs> Someone's laughing, yeah. <laughs> it's a voice of experience right there. Okay. Uh, here's a second P, the P of pleasure. So for some people, uh, it's the pursuit of pleasure that is their top priority and their, their deepest passion. And, and so it could be just some obvious like physical pleasures of life. It could be sex, drugs, rock and roll, that kind of thing like, like Norm was talking about in his, his story. Um, but it could also be the high life, kind of the distinguished, you know, it's the fine wines, the the, uh, the, the, you know, the great food, the, you know, just the comfortable life, but the P of pleasure. Uh, the third P is the P of possessions. And of course, this would take in wealth and all that wealth buys, but hey, it's where that our, our goal in life, our top priority is really, it's what we wear. Remember like Jesus said, don't worry about what you wear and like life's more important. It's what we wear, it's where we shop, it's the house we have, it's uh, redecorating the house, it's, it's, uh, it's the boat, it's the car, whatever the thing is. But it's some sort of possession, we're just kind of driven, almost like that old bumper sticker, the one with the most toys wins kind of thing. Right? We, we, that's our top priority. Uh, for others of us, it's the, the P of popularity. 
For some of us, the God that we bow down to will sacrifice anything is we want to be popular. We want to be part of the in crowd. We want to be loved and accepted. The worst thing in life is for us to be rejected. And so we'll, we'll do anything to be accepted. I could be like uh, codependency can go in there too. Uh, the next P is a P of position. That we just think if we can attain to a certain, if I can just get into this college, uh, if I can just be first chair in the band, if I can make cheerleader when we're younger, if, uh, if I can be the star of the, the college you know, football team, but it just goes on and on in life. If I can make the top salesman in this company, if I can get the corner office, if I can become an, a partner in the firm, but there's something that's driving us that really is a top passion. We'll sacrifice family, we'll sacrifice church, we'll sacrifice, you know, we're, we're a Christian, but it's like this is the top priority and deepest passion achieving that position. The, the, the sixth P is the P of power. And of course, this is why one of the greatest gods of the human race, it's why wars happen so often. It's about power. Why do we want power? Because power allows my will to be done. So you can see it in a family level, someone's a narcissist, they're gonna control, they, it's a power for my will to be done. You see it in a business team. You see it in, uh, you see it in uh, corporations. You see it on a football team. I want the place of power. It's all about power. How do I get rid of other people's power and I get the person power? And then the last P is the P of pursuit. That of course there's unlimited things that we can make our God, right? It's like, it could be just an activity. It's like, mountain biking, it could be skydiving, it could be scuba diving, it could be a certain hobby. But what these gods all have in common is simple. It's that if you were to boil it all down, they are the top priority and, and deepest passion of our life. We'll sacrifice everything else for them. And you say, well, why would we do this? And the reason we do this is deep down, we believe this God will make us happy. And that without this God, I won't be happy. So we may be single, for example, and our God is romance and getting married. This is an example. And deep down, we believe that Jesus is not enough. I need to get married, and I can't if, and so I will not surrender my dating life to Jesus because I need this to be happy. And that's true for every P. If I don't make this position, I won't be happy. If I'm not in this position of power, I won't be happy. So it's like, Jesus, you're good, and I want to follow you, but I also need this other God. But here's the reality. The truth the Bible keeps telling us over and over again, and I want you to listen very carefully, is there is nothing in creation that can satisfy the deepest need in the human heart for our creator. And every one of these gods will eventually let us down. Now let me say this. Many of these things I've mentioned are good things, aren't they? These are not bad, most things are good things. They're, they're God's gifts. But here's the thing, when you take a good thing and you make it the ultimate thing, it becomes a bad thing. And it will let you down every time. You know, yesterday I was at Starbucks, and you know I spend half my life at Starbucks. <laughs> and um, in fact, I, I think pretty soon they're putting up a name plaque for my, my desk area so no one else sits there. <laughs> but I love my Starbucks. It's like we, we it's this it's amazing crew there, love them. And, um, and so I was at Starbucks. But you know how it is when you're at Starbucks or a place like that? Sometimes you overhear conversations because it's fairly close quarters. And so there was this one couple there yesterday morning. I was there in the morning. Yesterday, there was a couple sitting at a high top across from me. And um, they, I was pretty sure they're married, right? Because they look, it was that combination of like super familiar with one another, super comfortable, and super bored, right? So <laughs> this is usually a sign... <laughs> that someone's married, right? Now, now, just to be super clear, I'm not saying that all married couples are like that. 
I'm just saying, when you see some, a couple that's like really comfortable and really bored, they're usually married. <laughs> and so I'm watching them. They're fairly, they're well put on. Just they're, they're, they're put together, what? They're clothes. They're probably in their 60s, maybe young, maybe 60, 59, something. But, and they're, they're put together pretty well, right? They, they look like they have some wealth on them. And uh, sure enough, when I see them leave, I see the car they're driving, and I won't mention them, but it's an expensive car. And so their whole conversation, this was Saturday morning, was where to have dinner Saturday night. And she was, they're both on their phones throwing out options to one another. And you could just read between the lines. We, we can hardly stand one another. Like, we're really bored. The only thing we share is we both like good food. So, like, where can we go? How sad is that? And this is what happened. Like, they're wealthy. I'm sure they've worked hard. They've got the, sort of the American dream. And they're completely empty. And this is what happens when we follow other gods. That's why Jesus said things like, Even when you have an abundance of possessions, a man's life doesn't consist in his wealth. It's like the most important thing about life is this relationship that we're created for, right? There's nothing in creation that can satisfy the deepest need of the human heart for a creator. And so often, the Lord's very patient with us. I know he was with me like pursuing other gods and stuff, you know, and the battles kind of go through. I mean, he's very patient, like he was with Israel. But we're not going to hear from God. We're not going to be led by, we're going to be like the horse or the mule. This jerk has to be jerked around because we're not totally surrendered. We're saying, you can have these rooms of my life, but not these rooms. And here's what I want you to catch. If you want to experience the presence and the power and the voice of the Holy Spirit, if you want to develop the kind of relationship where he can look across the room and you know what he means, or even his hint you pick up on, then we have to come to a place where we say the house is yours. And whatever you want to do, in whatever area, it may be hard, but I'm going to trust you because I believe what you said, Jesus, you've come to give me life and life to the full. And I believe that even whatever idols you ask me to lay down, that in the end, I'll be super glad I did. Oswald Chambers is one of my favorite writers, kind of a spiritual mentor. We don't have time for this whole quote, but I just want to to have you look at the last line of it, the last sentence, where he says, God will never reveal more truth about himself until you've obeyed what you already know. You know what he's saying? The Holy Spirit comes down knocking on the doors, hey, this is the next room, knock, knock, knock. We say, nope, no entrance. He's like, okay, I'll wait till you're ready. I'll be in the living room, you see? And the second question is a question that goes like this. Are you willing to go to the right or left? So in our, in our lives, we often have big decisions to make, and it's these times that we want to hear from God the most. So for example, hey, should I go to college or should I take a couple years off and, and do something different, you know? Uh, or start a career, you know, start a, a trade. Um, hey, should I stay in this relationship or is it dead end and I need to get out? Should I get married to this person or not? Should I change careers? Should I accept this new job offer? Should we change churches? Should our kids go to Christian school or public school? I mean, we could go on and on. That life is made up of these big decisions, aren't they? And they, they really, they change the trajectory of our lives. And so, so this is a time where as Christians, we often want to hear God the most. But here's what I've found, that in those times, until we come to this place of absolute surrender, where I'm willing to go to the right or to the left, it's going to be very difficult for me to discern what the Holy Spirit's saying. And a great model of this is Jesus. Uh, When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the very last night, 
uh, of his life before he was arrested and executed, you, you remember that, that he three times went out by himself to pray, and what he was really trying to discern was his father's will. Do I go to the right, which is the cross, or is there another option I can avoid this? And you remember that he was really clear he didn't want to go to the cross. So when I say that we have to be willing to go to the right or left, I don't mean that we equally like both options. I just mean that we're willing. So you remember Jesus went out and prayed three times, and I truly believe why he spent three seasons of prayer was because he didn't get his answer until the third time. That he had to wrestle that through. But you remember what his prayer was every time. His prayer was not my will, but your will. I'm ready to go to the right, I'm ready to go to the left. And finally, he got the clarity he needed that there was no other way. But the reason he was able to discern that was he was willing to go to the right or left. And this is what I found is that when we're making a big decision, often we're not really willing to hear what God's going to say. We just want him to say what we want him to say. And God's like, what's more important to him than the decision is your relationship and your heart. And so he uses these big decisions to get to our heart and to bring us to that place of absolute surrender. And once we get there, then he's able to direct us. George Mueller was a very famous uh, Christian in the 1800s. He lived in England. He was really famous for his deep relationship with God and his and answers to prayer, very like a great prayer warrior. But he also ran these orphanages for the, for the homeless children that were extreme poverty. And he never fundraised for all these orphanages. He just, he just prayed and trusted God to bring in the money. So he's got all this lifetime of supernatural provision. But because of this, people would go to him and they say, how do you discern the will of God in your life? And this is the answer that he gave them. He said, well, I seek at the beginning, you know, when I'm starting to seek God, I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to, I'm ready to go either way. He said, catch this, nine-tenths of the trouble with people generally is just here. We're asking God to direct us, but we don't want to hear. We only want to hear what we want him to say. He said, nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do the Lord's will, whatever it may be. And he says, when one is truly in this state, it's usually but a little way to the knowledge of what his will is. Once we're there, it doesn't take long for the Holy Spirit to show us. There's a beautiful verse in Isaiah. Uh, the situation is Isaiah's peering into the future, a time when Israel is in exile, but God still loves him and he wants to bring them back to the land. He wants to change them from the inside out, change their hearts. They truly love him with their whole heart. And he says, when that day comes, this is what it's gonna be like. He says, there in your note sheet, your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. And whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. So he says, Israel, I don't want you to be in the dark. I don't want you to feel far from me. He said, well, one day you're gonna come back and you're gonna give up your idols and you're gonna truly love me with all your heart. And when that day comes, we're gonna enter this new relationship and you're gonna hear a voice behind you. When you have to go to the right or left saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. See, this is the relationship Jesus died to give us. But the question is, will we surrender our lives and lay down our idols so that then God then can draw close and speak to us? You know, during this time right now, we're, we're going to be going into a time of communion. And during this time of communion, I want you to be thinking about a couple things. First, I want you to think of the price that Jesus paid to restore this love relationship. But secondly, I want, to, I want you to think of the life he modeled going to the cross of absolute surrender as a model for us to follow. For us, this is how we're transformed. 
And then what we're gonna do is after, after we have communion together, that I'm gonna give you the chance to surrender your life to God absolutely. And you may say, I've never, I've never done that. I've never had that moment. But maybe you're at a point in your life, you said, I'm sick of my idols. And you're right, they just always let me down. They always leave me empty. And I truly want Jesus to be my top priority and my deepest passion. And you may say, but I'm not sure I can do that because like you've said, I, I love these idols. You know, one of the things we find is that when, there's, when we have an idol in our life and it's our top passion, it's impossible for Jesus to become our top passion because there's someone sitting in his seat. And so you may say, I would love for that to be true, but honestly, I don't know if I can change my heart because I'm passionate about these other things, more passionate than for Jesus, and I don't know if I can change myself. And if that's you, I'd say, welcome to the club. And the beautiful thing is, you don't have to do it. The Holy Spirit can do that. But here's what you have to do. You have to come to a point where you're willing to say, Jesus, if you can change my heart, you can make loving, So we can do this. We don't need a microphone. You can hear me in the back, right? Yeah, I'm in. Okay. So we're going to covenant together that we're not going to miss a holy moment because of a lack of electricity. God's doing something special, isn't he? So if you're at this point in your life, you said, I'm willing. I can't change myself, but Lord, if you can change me, if you can make loving, knowing, pleasing you the top priority, if you can do that, here's the key phrase, I give you permission. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna be taking communion together and then after we're all back, then I'm gonna give you a chance to pray that prayer, to make that decision, to reboot, Am I on? Hey, I'm on. Here we go. <laughs> you know, it's so cool because we live in Fireland here. And because the solution is to turn off the electricity when, it winds, when the wind blows, <laughs> we installed our own generator a couple years ago. I don't know if we're sure we're using it, but this may be the first time. We'll find out later. But we're going to go into a time of worship and remember what Jesus did for us. The model he shows is the path forward. Hey, this is the path to life. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's when we die to ourselves, we rise with him to new life. And so we're going to do communion, go back to our seats, and then I'm going to give you a chance to surrender yourself, all the rooms of your house, to Jesus. And we're going to have a beautiful time of surrender together. Amen? Okay, so let me pray, then we'll go into worship. So Lord, we welcome your presence here. And we thank you that you gave everything for us to restore this relationship, this deep love relationship where we love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all our mind, all our strength, that you're our top priority, you're our deepest passion. And so Lord, we pray that as we come to this communion, that we remember the price you paid to make this relationship possible and the model you gave to teach us the path to life. We pray this in your name, amen.